Let's open the Word of God together this morning, church. We are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, continuing our study verse by verse. We'll be in verses 20 to 26 this morning. And I've entitled the sermon this morning, Your Reward is Great in Heaven. Your reward is great in heaven. I've often said it before, as I preach through books of the Bible, I could never possibly plan the calendar and the verses together in such a way to know what would uh, rise up in in a given week. It often seems throughout my years of ministry that whatever I'm preaching, it's like God makes me live it that week to prepare me to preach it that Sunday And with my mother's passing this Monday and preaching her funeral yesterday, God has certainly prepared my heart to preach on this topic this morning. And this is our hope, brothers and sisters, that our reward is great in heaven. What you're going to hear Jesus do in this passage is turn everything that the world believes upside down. Everything that the world teaches us to value, Jesus says, don't seek after those things. And everything that the world teaches us to avoid, Jesus says, embrace those things. Jesus just turns our world upside down and says that we literally live in upside down world. Have you felt like that lately? (laughs) Like down is up and up is down? Right is wrong and wrong is right? We, we live in a world that is crazy. And Jesus tells us why. Because they don't seek after his kingdom and his righteousness. They don't understand his word and his gospel. And, and brothers and sisters, Luke has a much shorter um, account of the Sermon on the Mount here. So here at the the second half of Luke chapter 6, we have a distilled, boiled down Sermon on the Mount. The full Sermon on the Mount can be found in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So, so Jesus cuts it like in a third, and he gives us the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, it begins with this passage, which is usually called the Beatitudes. This, this is how you are to live in the kingdom of Christ. This is the attitude that you are to have in this life and in the life to come. And Jesus just absolutely flips everything on its head. Luke 6, verse 20. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and he said... Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich. For you have received your consolation Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. I hope you notice here that this, this passage in, in, in literature, we call it a chiliasm. It, it is structured in such a way that it builds up and then 
it goes in reverse of the order that it started in. So if you look at verses 21, or second half of verse 20 through verse 23, you'll see that it is in parallel to, in reverse order to verses 24 to 26. So at, at the end of verse 20, you have blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And then in verse 24, you have woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So Jesus says it's the poor who are blessed, and it's the rich who are under the judgment of God. That is what that word woe means. And then he says in verse 21, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. And in verse 25, he says, Blessed are you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. You see the reverse, right? And then notice the next one. It says, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Matthew translates this, you who mourn, and it probably refers to losing a loved one or any grief that you face in this life. Maybe, maybe you've lost your job or you've been hurt. Um, you could think of, of so many times when a person would grieve and mourn over just heartache and, and, and turmoil in this life. He says, but blessed are you if, if you're weeping now, because you shall laugh. And then he says in verse 25 in the second half, he says, What are you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep? It's the opposite. And then in verse 22, he said, Blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Blessed are you when they persecute you, is the way he puts this in Matthew. And then in verse 26, he says, Woe to you when all people speak well of you. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You know what Jesus does here? He says, this is the blessed life. You want to hear what the blessed life sounds like? To be poor, hungry, sorrowful, and hated by the world. That's the blessed life. And here is the cursed life. Are you ready? The cursed life is to be rich, to be full, to be laughing, and to be popular. Does Jesus not absolutely turn the values of our world upside down? He does. Why is that? The key and any chiliasm is always found in the center. Anytime you have this building up and then going backward, you look to the center. It's like a giant sign and it's pointing like this and it's saying the answer is right here in the middle. And the answer is in the middle. And the middle is at the end of verse 23. The answer to why it's upside down is because your reward is great in heaven. That's why it's better to be hungry now and full in eternity. That's why it's better to be poor now and rich in heaven. That's why it's better to be hated now but to reign with Jesus Christ forever. Brothers and sisters, these things are true because heaven is a real place where God will, will, will reward His people forever. And it's because heaven is real. It's because eternity awaits us that these things are true. Because if this life is all that we have, well then we would try to be rich and full now and laugh now. And we would try to be popular if this world is all we have, well, you, you know the phrase, YOLO, right? You only live once. No, you don't. That's the whole point of the Bible. You're going to live forever, either in heaven or in hell. Now, which do you want it to be? Absolutely reverses everything that our world believes in. So let's walk through it verse by verse, starting in verse 20. And let's really dig into what Jesus is saying here. Verse 20. He lifted up his eyes on his...
disciples. I mentioned last week that this word disciples, it's the Greek word mathetes. Mathetes is a, a word that means to be a learner. To be one who comes under a teacher, namely Jesus, and learns from him. To be a learner, to be a disciple of Jesus means that we don't understand the right values and worldview, but we are wanting to learn that from Jesus. So to be a disciple implies that I don't have this all figured out, but Jesus does, and I want to learn the truth from him. So he looked at his disciples, the ones who wanted to learn the truth from him. And this is what he said, and I'm sure they stood there like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> You're telling me that I should want to be poor? <laughs> You're telling me that I should want to be hated and hungry and, and, and weeping? That's the blessed life? Let's think about it. Let's start with blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, some Bible commentators have pointed that the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 5 in his accounting of the Sermon on the Mount says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And so, yes, Matthew says poor in spirit. Luke says blessed are the poor. To be poor in spirit and to be poor really emphasizes two different things. Poor in spirit means humble, right? Spiritually humble. But to be poor means, well, you know what it means to be poor, right? It means to have nothing. Actually, to not even have enough for life. Now, some have said, well, Luke doesn't literally mean poverty here. He means poor in spirit. But if Luke meant poor in spirit, wouldn't he have said poor in spirit like Matthew did? It just seems to me that, that he said what he meant and he meant what he said. And I think Matthew is expressing one spiritual truth, that God's people are to be humble. And Luke is expressing another spiritual truth. But here's what Luke is not saying. He is not saying you are spiritually superior if you have less money. That's not what he's saying. All you have to do is read the rest of Luke's gospel to find out that's not the case. What is he saying? Well, Jesus teaches us not to love money. Jesus teaches us not to find our comfort in money. Jesus teaches us not to store up everything in a barn and saying, oh, I'll have plenty for the rest of my life. He'll say later in a parable, you fool today, your soul is required of you. Look, we don't put our hope or our trust in money. Money itself is not evil, but the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. You understand, money itself is neutral. Loving money is what is evil. It's not that you should desire to be poor. Jesus' point here is the blessed life does not consist of having money. You should be able to be happy, content, and satisfied whether you have little or much money. The word blessed, makaroi in Greek, it is, a, it is a word that means to have fullness of joy. It, it means that it's come from God, that you have been so, your needs have been so supplied and met by God that you have joy. It's not just happiness because, because to be blessed, it's not temporary happiness but it is an enduring joy that gets you through the hardships of life. So blessed is probably most equivalent to the way we use the word joy in English. It, it, it is a steadfastness of the soul and a contentment even in the midst of sorrow and grief and pain and anguish. And he says you are blessed even if you're poor. In other words, the poorest 
Christian on this earth is far more blessed than the wealthiest unbeliever. I would rather have riches in heaven than riches on this earth. That is why Jesus will go on to say, do not labor for that which you cannot keep. Don't work for treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Listen, he's not saying money is evil, and he's not saying it's a bad thing if you have some money. What he is saying is it's an evil thing if you love your money. Listen, if God blesses you with money, use it for his glory. Take care of your wife, take care of your children, take care of your grandchildren, give, be generous, be kind. But love Jesus and love the people that he has given you, not money. Listen, money can only buy certain things. But the things that are really valuable, the things that matter the most in this life, money can't buy. You realize no amount of money can buy you another day on this earth. The Bible says in Job chapter 14 that God has written down your days in a book and you can neither add to nor take away from them. Psalm 139, verse 15. David says that God has written down every one of my days in his book when as yet there was none of them. Brothers and sisters, God has appointed a day on which you would begin to live, the day in which you were conceived in your mother's womb, and God has appointed a day on which you will die. And you do not know when that appointed day is. Hebrews 9 says, it is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. The day of your death has been appointed by God. So if you are poor in this life, realize something. This life is temporary. It is but a mist. It appears for a moment and then vanishes. But heaven is forever and hell is forever. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that if we have this temporary life that is fleeting, that is slipping through our fingers at this very moment, and if you don't believe it's slipping through your fingers at this very moment, let me ask you a question. If you're over the age of, say, 25, do you feel better today than you did 10 years ago? 20 years ago? 30 years ago? If if you had to run a mile... You say, I couldn't do it to begin with, okay. But let let me just ask you, if you had to sprint to the other end of the room, you think you'd have been faster 10 or 20 years ago or today? Listen, all of us are in a process of dying, are we not? Aging and sickness and sorrow and death are all a reminder that we live in a fallen world and it's been messed up by our sin And so if you're poor in this life, realize you're poor for a very short time, but you have riches in heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter Peter tells the Christians, he says, listen, you have an inheritance in heaven which can never perish, spoil, or fade. Your life on this earth is like a gallon of milk. It has a short shelf life, right? You better drink it quickly or it's, it's going to go bad. But your reward in heaven, it will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's, it's kind of like a Twinkie or something, you know? It's just, this thing just has no expiration date. It's incredible. 
don't eat a 10-year-old Twinkie and blame me. I'm not endorsing that. But the, the point is, if you're poor in this life, listen, you should not desire poverty. That's not what Jesus is saying. I don't want you to be poor. You shouldn't aspire to be poor. But listen, sometimes you just don't have what others have. And this is what Jesus is saying. That's okay. That's okay. You don't need money to be happy. You need Jesus to be happy. And so if you don't have what others have, that's okay. You have riches in heaven. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions, Jesus says. That is not what makes your life meaningful, joyful, or valuable. Knowing Jesus and loving those that he has given you to enjoy this life and hopefully eternity with, that's what really matters. So blessed are you if you're poor. Why? How in the world are poor people blessed? Because yours is the kingdom of God. Because you have heaven waiting on you. So you can be happy even if you're poor because you know what's coming. Blessed are you who are hungry now. And every Baptist said, I don't know about that, Jesus. I like to eat. Matthew says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, for they shall be filled. And look, that is true. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew expresses a biblical truth that we should hunger and thirst for the things of God. Absolutely. Praise God. Amen. But that's not what Luke wrote. It's a similar statement, but it's a very different statement. I believe Luke is talking about real hunger pains. He's speaking to people who've missed meals. They know what it's like to be hungry. And we in 21st century America, we don't quite know hunger like they did. Let's be honest. Most of us have food to eat every day. There are very few of us who have had a time in our life where we literally could not eat for days because we had nothing to eat. Most of us have never even experienced that, but these people had. They knew what it was like to be hungry and not know how they were going to feed their children. That's why he fed the 5,000. You realize that, right? There were all these hungry people and they needed to eat. Jesus is not saying you don't need to eat. Amen, somebody. Come on. He's not saying it's a bad thing to eat. It's a bad thing to eat too much, yes, but it's not a bad thing to eat. Food is a blessing. Amen? Come on, Baptist. Amen. All right. Now, we, we know that food is a good thing, but here's what Jesus is saying. If you're hungry in this life because you have nothing to eat, there is a feast, a banquet prepared for you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Even if you're hungry now, and starvation is not a good thing, it's a terrible thing. But even if that is what you're experiencing now, you have more than you could ever need in heaven. So blessed are you who are hungry now. And you see that qualifier now? It's important. He's saying your hunger is temporary. But you shall be satisfied. In heaven, you will be satisfied forever, never to hunger or thirst again. That's good news. And, th and then he says, blessed are you who weep now. My mother died this week. I preached her funeral yesterday. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. And yes, I've weeped a lot this week. And here I am preparing this week as I'm going through that to preach. But one day soon I shall laugh. When will I laugh? When I hug my mom in heaven one day? We're going to see our loved ones in Christ again. That's a real biblical truth, brothers and sisters. Have you ever been so happy that all you could do is laugh? Because you, You're not laughing like it's a 
It's a funny joke. You're laughing because you're so overcome with joy that you, you, just, you just fall apart and laugh and you think, my God, you are so good and I didn't understand how glorious this moment would be until I got here and I got to hug my son, my daughter, my husband, my wife, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my friend who died. I didn't realize how good it would be when we finally got to eternity and I got to embrace them again. Listen to me, if you are in Christ and your loved one is in Christ, that day is coming soon and in that day you will stop crying and you will laugh. Revelation 21 verse 4, it says, and God will, Himself will be with His people and He Himself will be their God and He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Neither shall there be sorrow or mourning or pain anymore because the former things have passed away. And behold, he who was seated on the throne spoke and said, Behold, I am making all things new. Write these words down. They are trustworthy and true. Do you realize, do you realize how good heaven will be? No. None of us realize how good it'll be because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what no heart, what no, no, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man even imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. That verse says heaven is better than you can even imagine. It's so good you can't even imagine something that good. And in that day when you experience that, you will laugh. So yes, blessed are you if you're weeping over your lost loved one now because one day soon you're going to hold him again and you'll laugh. Verse 22, blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Oh goodness. This culture hates us, brothers and sisters. They hate us because they hate our king. They hate how he made us as man and woman. They hate how he created and defined marriage between one man and one woman. They hate the fact that we don't live like they live and talk like they talk and act like they act and live for the things that they live for. They hate everything about us because everything about our light exposes their darkness. And darkness hates the light. And if people hate you, notice the qualifier at the end of verse 22, on account of the Son of Man. So if they hate you because you're following Jesus. Verse 23, if this world hates you, you should rejoice in that day. It's interesting Rejoice is present tense. Not you will rejoice. Rejoice now in that day. He literally tells us to rejoice now in the day that is to come. Present tense verb, future object. Rejoice now at what's coming. That's what he says. Take joy now that heaven is coming. Rejoice now in the day that is to come and leap for joy. You ever been so happy you jumped up and down? I mean, that only happens like with little kids on Christmas morning, right? I mean, that kind of happiness, that's, that's rare. You, right now, leap for joy. For behold, and here's the whole point of the passage. Your reward is great in heaven. It's better than you can even imagine. Your reward is great in heaven. And then he reminds us at the end of verse 23. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Listen, if the world hates you, Jesus says, remember it hated me first. A few months ago I preached that passage from John 15. If the world hates you, remember it hated me first. Jesus says here, if the world hates you, remember that your fathers hated the prophets. They threw Jeremiah into a pit. They wanted to kill Moses because he wouldn't take them back to Egypt. 
They got angry at Joshua. They got angry at Isaiah, Ezekiel. The, the, the prophets of the Old Testament, they were outcasts. Everybody hated them. You know why? Because they spoke the truth. Listen, if this world were good, it would love you. This world hates you because this world is evil. If you decide to follow Jesus and stand for the truth, you will be hated. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says that all, not some, not most, not many, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. As Dr. Stephen Lawson has, says, has said, the problem with Christians today is that nobody wants to kill them anymore. You realize that's the history of the church. The church has been persecuted generation after generation after generation. And brothers and sisters, the church is being persecuted today but many of those today who claim to be the church and are not being persecuted, let me tell you something. They're not being persecuted because they're not standing for the truth. And they're not standing for the truth because they're not the church. You follow me? Yeah. Give in to the culture. Buy into its lies. Celebrate their definition, redefinition of marriage. And they will celebrate you and love you for it. And if this life is all we have, that such a calculation would make sense. But only a fool would do that because eternity is coming. Now look at verse 24. Jesus teaches us not to love the world or the things of the world. Verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Ouch. Or as he says in Matthew, woe to you who are rich, you have received your reward. Um, here's what he says to unbelieving rich people. Unbelieving rich people, that's who he's speaking to here. He says, right now is the most comfortable you'll ever be. This is the best you will ever have it, unbelieving rich man or woman, because the fires of hell await you. So enjoy this fleeting moment, because it's very short, and eternity is a very long time. Woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your consolation. You have no further comfort. You have no further reward because you have rejected the one and only Son of God. Verse 25. Woe to you who are full now. So this is the unbeliever who has plenty in this life. You shall be hungry. You won't be feasting in hell. You will feel hunger then. Woe to you who laugh now. And of course, this would be the laughter of this world that scoffs at the things of God. <laughs> There's a whole thing that unbelievers do on Facebook. They, they take a Christian's post, post in a Bible verse or some biblical truth, and they just do the laughing response. You know what I'm talking about, right? Young people, you've seen that, right? It's like a whole thing that, that they do. is They just go through and laugh at what Christians say. Yeah. Just, just put this verse next time they do that. What are you who laugh now? For you shall mourn and weep. You're laughing now, but judgment is coming. And it will not be pretty in that day. And then verse 26. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. 
I told my wife I would be preaching this passage, and I read that verse to her, and she said, well, you don't have any problem with that, because there's plenty of people that don't like you. Thanks, Trish. Appreciate that. But it's true. And it's true of anyone who actually believes and lives by this book and who lives for this Savior. Jesus literally says, if you are popular in this world, then something is wrong. Because this world would not love you if you were living for me. Think about that. What does every teenager in junior high and high school want? To be popular, at least most of them do. Hear me, young people. You don't want to be popular. Because the things that make you popular are the things that grieve your Savior. It's true. You don't want to be popular. Neither when you are young nor when you are old. If they hate you at your job because you live for Jesus... You don't want to be popular. I I used to have a lot of friends at the Louisiana State Capitol and in Washington, D.C. I was regularly invited to the governor's mansion. I knew almost every state representative and senator on a first-name basis and had all of their cell phone numbers and talked to them. I lobbied bills to get them passed in the legislature to try to put Christian values back into Louisiana law. I was flown to Washington, D.C., met the vice president, spent time with my U.S. congressmen and senators. I got to do all these things. And then last year, I said, hey, let's try to pass a bill in Louisiana that totally ends abortion in our state. Let's just say that life begins at the moment of fertilization, which we call conception, but the moment at which the sperm and the egg meet and life begins to grow. And let's say that's the moment that life begins, and from that moment, every life will be equally protected from that moment until natural death, so that no one has the right to kill any innocent person, be they in the womb or outside the womb. No one has the right to murder another person. Sounds very pro-life. Sounds very biblical. (laughs) They won't answer my text messages or phone calls anymore. They don't invite me anymore. When I go to the Capitol, they glare at me. And many of them have told me personally how much they hate me. Why? Because I said, well, we say we believe this. We say we believe that life begins at the moment of fertilization and should be protected until the moment of natural death, that no one has a right to kill an innocent person, period. Let's put that into law. We can't do that. Let's just Google my name. Read what the New York Times Read what the Washington Post, the L.A. Times, CNN, ABC, NBC. Read what they all said about me. They hate me. And if you stand for the truth, they're going to hate you too. But I don't care. Because great is our reward in heaven. Amen? I don't care what this world thinks. I care what Jesus thinks. And what he thinks is the exact opposite of what they think. And listen, if you please Jesus, it does not matter whom you displease. And if you displease Jesus, it does not matter whom you please. The reality is, brothers and sisters, you're going to either live for the approval of this world or the approval of King Jesus, but you cannot have it both ways, so just decide which is it going to be. 
Are you living for this life? Or are you living for the life to come? Are you storing up treasures on earth? Or are you storing up treasures in heaven? You cannot have it both ways. Choose which side you are on. And refusing to choose is choosing this world and this life and rejecting eternity. You realize if you sit there and you do not bend the knee to Christ and believe in Him, you don't get a pass on the day of judgment. If you refuse to bend the knee to Christ and refuse to come to Christ, if you refuse to lay down your life and follow him on judgment day, he will not say, well, you didn't choose, so I'm going to give you a pass and you won't go to either heaven or hell. You'll go to this third option where you just kind of, you know, uh, don't get either. That's not how it works. Your name is either in the Lamb's book of life or you will be judged according to your sins on the day of judgment. You are either lost or saved. You are either going to heaven or hell. It's one or the other. And unless you come to Christ, you have your reward right now. So which is it going to be? This is the attitude that you must have. These are the B attitudes for everyone who lives under the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and each one here. And God, I ask that you would just call us to holiness and faithfulness to Christ and his gospel and his word, no matter what the world may think. And God, how I ask that you would call the lost to salvation right now. Anyone here today who does not know Jesus, give them the courage to come forward right now and to make it known, I want to follow Jesus. I'm ready to give my life to him no matter what the cost, no matter what the world thinks. I don't care. I want Jesus. And then give the rest of us the faith and the confidence and the love of Christ to live for him no matter what. And give us the grace that we need every day to follow that faith through and continue following Jesus until he comes again. God, make our lives count for something. They are so short. And we have such little time. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.